Human Relations here at Johnston Rose University. I'm a proud alum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program. Before we get into our presentation, I would like to introduce Frank Tweedy, class of 1995 and 1998 with his master's, Dean of the College of Engineering and Design, to say a few words. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming, and I thank those virtually who are watching us. Uh, it's, it's great to see Castellan from these doors, really the old doors. But in celebration of October, the Cybersecurity Month, um, we have a great presentation for you. Uh, I'm the professor, and uh, you'll get to know Anthony a little bit better in a few minutes, but this is how, about our program. Our program was uh, celebrating the fifth month of our certification of NSA, certification as a Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Education. So we opened up a center and we hired the director. He is in class right now. I spoke to him a little bit earlier. Uh, I'll do a <laughs> after the presentation so you can see the rest of the day if you have not seen it. But it's, it's, it's truly exciting to see a program that Myself and many of you might have known Dr. Calabrese uh, went to the Naval Academy and we worked with the Naval Academy to look at their program. And they helped us build a framework for our program. And here we are today, certified by NSA. We have a lot of projects in the work for the state police, building some uh, cyber awareness programming for high school teachers. We, also put in a million dollar grant with the federal government to fund more of all that outreach for our um, community. We're building tremendous relationships with other NCAE community members, those are the certified members. And we're also building really strong relationships with industry. And a lot of you here are in the industry, and that's a really good plus. Sorry, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll see you in our networking after. And then for those that want to go on a tour, I'll take that. Okay. Thank you, Dean Tweedy. What an exciting time it is for the college. Tonight's program, Heights with a Professor, Cybersecurity is Hybrid in Nature. So we have some alumni here with us today and others joining us on Zoom. I'd like to review a few housekeeping items before we get started. While tonight's program will be very informative, we'd like to keep it casual. If you have questions for our presenter, please raise your hand throughout the session and he'll call on you. For those on Zoom, please add them to the Q&A section. Our team will be monitoring them in real time and we'll ask your question aloud. I'd also like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes today, especially Crystal Kendall, who's sitting in the back right there, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations and Fred J. Wu alumna herself for her work to bring us this program tonight. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Associate Professor Anthony Chavis. Anthony has been with Johnson Wales University since 2016, teaching cybersecurity and network, networking courses in the College of Engineering and Design. Prior to joining Jamie, he served in the US Army in military intelligence for 10 years. He's also spent time as a private contractor working for various companies United States government and agencies in the fields of signal intelligence, cybersecurity, and network engineering. Anthony, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Johnson Wells. Welcome to the building. Welcome to our Interstate Certified Program. It's awesome to see some nice faces, some familiar faces, some faces that I taught. Hope no one's mad. No hard feelings. No hard feelings. Please, please take it easy on me. Uh, I'm just happy to see it. We're going to talk a few things today about shortage in personnel and cybersecurity. We're going to talk about some zero trust items, go over some things, and just talk about everyday life in cybersecurity at large. Um, feel free to jump in, questions, comments, concerns, any point in time you guys who have any before you've heard that line before. Questions, comments, concerns. I say it all the time. I apologize. Uh, for anyone on Zoom, feel free to uh, add it to the chat and we will um, address your boxes, uh, your questions in the chat box as needed. Uh, we have a new moderator taking care of that for us. Um, but we're very excited to have you all here. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you for giving your time. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, let's see what we got here. Got our own office style head. Got our office style head. <laughs> so as I see a lot of tech faces, we already know this. A lot of you already know this and, and going forward. 
passwords matter. Passwords matter. Why are you all working in tech? You're doing these things. You're going through them, and you see these things matter. You see bad policies being written. You see um, items out of order. You see, hey, I, I took over, took over a contract, and the password literally was seven characters. That's all they had to put in for a password. And I was trying to explain to them, I said, hey, that's that's not a lot of characters. You know what I mean? That's a, that's going to be broken in seconds. Like, that's not that infeasible. So, it's been straightened out. Things of that nature. Um, it's as professionals and cybersecurity practitioners, we have to think about these things as we go forward. And um, just as a question, uh, when you have social media, just raise your hand if you have social media. Social media at any time, all right? And social media, you're out there. Um, you got pictures of high school on social media, pictures of um, pets on social media, pictures of girlfriends, boyfriends, and a few others, grandparents. Schools you went to, jobs you worked at, things of that nature, right? You have that, those, that memory collection in social media, right? Now, now I'll start talking about this right here. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Tell me if these questions sound familiar to you at all whatsoever. Um, first elementary school, you would think? Security questions. Dog's so, so first name. Yeah. Right? Those are all your PII questions, right? All your PII questions. You guys probably haven't been to school before. I know someone's been four years, definitely heard this school before. Um, why do we, why, why, that's not good security anymore, is it? So why do we still, why do we still go about that process? If all your information is online, all I have to do is have an account to your IG, Instagram for non. <laughs> uh, sorry, Dave, I'm just trying to right now. <laughs> on your Instagram or your, your LinkedIn or whatever you might have, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not good security. It's out there. It's known to the public. If you're a public facing figure, you're a professor, or you're a teacher, or you're a CTO, you're Information is out there. They're going to grab it, and most likely, most likely, if you're a soft target, that's that's who they're coming at first. Someone's trying to hack the big companies of the world. It's too hard. It's too hard. Most hacking happens at the lower levels, the small business level, the medium business levels. That's what we're going to be attacking at. That's that's the attack vector threat. That's what these threat actors are going to be coming at. They're coming at this guy. They're coming at this guy, right? Here. So we're talking about zero trust. Zero trust. Zero trust. Why is zero trust? Why do we not trust? Everyone's heard of it. It's involved. All kinds of the background. Zero trust. Zero trust. It's it's sublimely simple. It came about about 2009, 2010. The architecture came out and it got adopted fully by the federal government in 2021. Um, in this standard practice installed data, it's one line, right? And this 800 207. I keep saying 27, it's 207. So, but that being said, it comes in and it changes everything, especially after the pandemic. <laughs> what happened during the pandemic? Everyone went where? Everyone went remote. We all went remote. We all were sitting down behind a desk, having a good time, having meetings in our shorts, flip flops, <laughs> looking really professional on the screen. And then when someone is not looking, turn the camera off, getting something to eat, putting the bowl down, putting the, putting the drink down, come back on camera to speak, right? <laughs> I've been in a lot of problems for companies, lots of problems for companies, lots of problems for users. If you're in cyber, you know this. Zoom took on major security threats immediately early in the pandemic. Just, they had they had issues, major issues. They spent millions and well, millions of dollars. I don't have to stat here, but we know it's lots. So going forward from that, what do other companies do? What happens if your computer breaks while you're at work during the pandemic? Oh, no worry, boss. Don't worry, boss. I'll log on from my what? From my device. From my device. Oh, that's, that's a really great idea, right? That's a great idea from a cyber effect. Let me log on my device to the company network because I have to do my work. What happens if you're a very important employee? You're a high profile employee, your work has to be done. Maybe you're in charge of finance, you're in charge of your resources. Maybe you have something that's due that has to be done and they have to increase your access. That's a, that's a huge problem for that. Um, here's a story. I'm going to use a story from Charles. This is from your class, actually. Uh, from your last class you took with me, as a matter of fact, I still use the story, it's old, so I don't hate you for it. <laughs> um, one of Gerard's classmates brought up a, a story that I told you guys I'd be using it later years. Um, <laughs> users are going to win. Users are going to win, they're going to get what they want. Users are going to win every time over cyber security threats, they're going to get what they want, right? Because they're, they're the customer in the end. You provide a service, you get a customer. Um, and we start talking about the real Zero trust, how does that compete? How does that compete with usability? How does it compete with availability? We start getting to that CI triad of things. Availability is huge. Like we always focus on that, that 
confidentiality and integrity in the triad, but it's really availability that wins out consistently with users. As you think about it, because that person who needs that laptop with that BYOP device on that network, they're going to need access. And at that point in time, during the pandemic, maybe your VPN wasn't set up for that. Maybe your VPN was like, oh, we're going to call it a trusted machine and hope Johnny, Johnny Bob, Sue, Q, whoever it is, ran an update. Has firewall, has some kind of antivirus protection on the computer, does not click on random emails, does not go to, does not have kids that jump on the computer and click on random cartoon sites and click all the games, right? We're hoping that. That's, that's a lot that's happening, right? We all know it's like professionals. The weakest point of any cybersecurity thing is it's us. It's the human factor. We already know that. As we get into it, we're going to talk a little bit, a little, little bit of high level stuff about this. Oh, sorry, I went way too fast. Control the one button. As we talk about this and the nature of how things have changed, since then, the culture has changed for users. How many people went to work every day this week? I to work every day this week. Some of you guys didn't go to work every day. How many people went two days a week? Almost. Remote. We have to have the remote option. You have a remote option. It changes things, right? Now, pre pandemic, you're on premises 24 7. 24 7. As a cyber professional, you're on premises 24 7, playing solitary, taking it easy, having a good time. I mean, playing solitary. But you're monitoring the IPS, you're monitoring different threats, you're going through different things, you're doing what you're doing, um, whatever the case may be, checking tons and tons and tons of phishing emails. Probably the most case for everyone that, that happens is just can't seem to stop it. Um, we'll talk about that here shortly. Um, and as you get there, going on the premise to the cloud now, now AWS, Azure, all these cloud services, third party providers are there. How much do we trust them? Look how you bought Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or something on their phone recently. Bought something, someone did that. How, why do you trust your phone? You want know stuff going on your phone every day? Do people you walk by? Right? Maybe you walk by, you <laughs> grab something around your phone just like that. Right? Back on point, you're being funny. <laughs> you do something just like that, you can take information's gone. It's gone. Depending on what you're doing. So, zero trust is simply broke down to three different guidelines. I have to change this, I'm not pressing this. I think I know how to use power on now. <laughs> but zero trust breaks down basically, we're always going to. You just have a question in the chat for me. Yes, go ahead. With the growth of remote working slash working from home, do you think there will be a shift in requirements for residential networks for those employees? I would hope residential networks, um, for residential networks or home networks, uh, they should be putting out, the employees should be putting out information on how to secure your home network. If not, beefing up their VPNs, going to do things, providing company laptops that are secure and have, have different capabilities, such as remote white, and could have the, uh, all the chat with the chip in now. So they can do um, encryption, the AES encryption for those people are going to use Microsoft without any of you all or using this laptop. So major links on patients on it from a major business. So I was taking the, the Microsoft realm and in fact, use the, the next round, the NIX round. So we'll do that. Um, what that allows is that allows them to mitigate the risk. And I don't know if there's going to be any mandates put forth by the question, but I do know companies should have an ethical responsibility to their employees. Make sure that employees' information remains safe, the BII and their services remain safe. So that not only the employee has to remain safe, but whatever the employee is doing, also that transaction that data, that data is, is always in motion. Now, we're not talking about stacking data sitting on a server going from desktop A in parking and building A down to the server room. Basically, we're talking about multiple integrations of factors there. All right. Hope I answered your question online. So what, that, what I was saying was zero trust. Zero trust is don't trust anyone, ever. Always, always, always continually verify. Constantly verify. Who are you? Oh, okay. Who are you again? <laughs> I don't know, right? We get tired of it. We get tired of it, right? I mean, people have password managers. Log in, face ID, Apple on your iPhone. You that thing, you get tired of logging in. Users are going to win. So now we're in the issue with zero trust. Zero trust main issues. Its biggest opponent is us. It's us as users, not us as technical professionals, but us as users. 
And as we talk about zero touch architecture, we get into it. We're going to see how that, how that kind of, how those two things go away. That continuous verification, that impact minimization, how are we minimizing our risk factors, our risk rates? How are we making that smaller? How are we making that better for the customer and the client? Um, what are we doing? Lastly, and which we're trying to grow here at the school a lot now, automation. Automation. Everything has to be automated. No one wants to sit behind the machine and do it. Same thing. Oh, it's too easy to write it in Python and get it to do it over and over and over and over again, or PowerShell or Bash or whatever you want to use. Cobol. I got it right here. I got it right here. I have a lot of space. So, I mean, I had to spend So, zero trust. Zero trust. I like to equate zero trust to this doing right here. This is the President of the United States. Um, and if we could just. Right. We're going to watch a quick 30, 40 second slideshow here. Um, Real quick. President Ronald Reagan has a very famous line, trust but verify. And he talks about this and what? He talks about this and we're going to kind of spin off cybersecurity and how that works into our zero uh, zero trust architecture. So when they go at first, who do you think if they resist who will play? It's still trust and verify. We still play and cut the cards. Still watch culture and don't be afraid to see what you see. I like that last part. Don't be afraid to see what you see. Don't be afraid to see what you see. When you're in there, you're working your IPS, you see these things. We all know we've seen the IPS data, we've seen it come off the IDS, IPS, and the device you're using. And for the most part, it's mostly false. Right? It's not false. Things. It's false positives. It's mostly false positives. You get a lot of false positive hits or a lot of phishing attacks. That's going to be a generic thing you're getting all the time, constantly, constantly, constantly. What happens when you see that positive? What, do, what, do, what, what are your escalation? What do you do? But zero trust, it's a little different. It's a tad bit different. Everything you don't trust. You don't trust the false positive. You don't trust the false negative. You check everything continuously. And you automate that process so you don't have to do it all the time. And you continuously improve the automated process so it continues to work better, 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 better. And as you're automating that process, you're going to see things become more standard. You're going to see things, you're going to start seeing rhythms. Hey, why is the same person the same thing happening every time the same day? Hackers are lazy, predators are lazy. You're going to automate too. Why not? Why, why do I want to try a billion tries to sit here and watch? I'm going to set it together, right? I'm going to set my writer program. I'm going to scan the reports. I'm going to do it all automated. I'm just look for where it's open. Oh, there's one. Somebody left port 80 open. Someone's using Windows 7 still. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having this on your server. That's a nice gift. I do all your things. And we know, we know cyber professionals and some users, users usually don't know this. Users don't know that everything a hacker knows, they get from the vendor. Those things come right from the vendor. They tell you in the CVE. They have a thing that says, hey, here's your update, and here's what's wrong with your computer. Boom, 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 boom. And all you say, oh, that's what's wrong. XYZ is wrong, so I'm going to apply XYZ fault. I'm going to try to get it. It's not that hard. Take some talent, but it's already there. Like the first step is there for you. Um, we did an exercise maybe a few weeks back in class. And we, in the freshman class, we were seeing how easy it is to obtain malware, how easy it is to obtain malware. So I had them all on a VM, all on a VM. Jarvis is laughing because I uh, had a VM incident in freshman year. Uh, all on a VM, <clears throat> fine malware. How long was it took for a freshman, unexperienced in cybersecurity, eight minutes and 47 seconds, find active malware that can actually work? If that's all it takes, why do we trust our devices and things of that nature? How much do you really trust that, that I watch, that Samsung watch? How much do you trust that PayPal app, right? right? How, much, how much trust you can give? You're not gonna give it a whole lot of trust. That's what we have, zero trust. That's what we're doing here. You wanna make sure you are protected from ransomware from point A to all the other endpoints 
in your system. Minimize that, that principle of least privilege. You want to take all the privileges they have. You want to take it and minimize it. Right? We can talk about, see, we're talking about this policy, all these policies. But in the end, it's privilege. Who has the privilege of the access? Who has the root access? Who has the administrative access? Who's right clicking in the run machines? That's where it gets it. That's where it starts getting interesting. But well, why is zero trust? Why are we using zero trust? We have these things here, benefits. Accurate inventory infrastructure, improved monitoring and learning, improved end user experience, streamlined security policy creation, flexible when moving apps, data, and services. Those are all some nice things to have on the screen so I can talk to you about right now. That's what they were put there for us. So I can look fancy, seem like I know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> let's break that down in latest terms. Let's break that down in latest terms. Accurate inventory infrastructure. So we all know. Who's the first thought? Who's your first thought? Can I ask the question? Who's your first thought? Like I said, accurate, accurate inventory of infrastructure. You thought something physical, right? Think an Amazon warehouse, right? Why aren't you thinking SQL? Why aren't you thinking databases, right? So that's that's really what's flying through here. Accurate inventory of the infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure now is IT, right? And really, who holds IT together? We do. <laughs> we hold it together, we keep it alive. Right, but without, without I, be honest, for all the IT people, we have no job without you. Without any network, there's no cybersecurity. Let's be, let's be frank about that. But the aggregate inventory infrastructure, what about your social feeds, all those things? You know those things you have. You make sure those things are secure. You want to be adding things to your network that shouldn't be there. Improve monitoring and learning. That goes without saying. You want to know what's there, how fast you get there, how fast your operation reacts, what's your process? Are you IPS? Are you IES? If you're in a business situation, you probably want to be running both. One in line, one out of line, so manage the speeds and get your rewrite speed and get your what as fast as possible. Improve the end user experience. In the end, I refer back again. How great is the end user? The end user is the greatest. And now I'm going to tell your story. So the student said, I had an internship and we made two separate networks. One was a guest network and one was a work network. We told all the employees to, when they want to do something Facebook related, not work related, go to the guest network. And use that. He said it lasts about four days. Because users got mad. They had to log off one network, log into another to use their phone computer. And so they did a lot of work to create a network, and they had to take it right back down and then add filters in for the additional things. Because users are going to win. Usability is going to win for security almost all the time until we start seeing security leaks. The problem is you don't see security leaks until it's too late, right? And once that, that leak starts, Usability goes out the window. Oh, everyone's hair's on fire. Hey, hey, hey. Cybersecurity is much like all the government agencies. All the government agencies. How many times have you guys been awarded great job this week for not getting penetrated or not getting hacked? No one's come over and shoot your hand for that, right? They come over and get mad at you when something goes wrong, right? Just like the CIA. No one gives credit to the CIA. You have all these weeks and months of peace. No one's, no one's like, hey, thank you, CIA. Thank you, FBI. But let something go wrong. Why? Why did we see this coming? Right, same thing in cybersecurity. Same thing in cybersecurity. It's a big internet, guys. Big internet, everyone. It takes a lot of money to cover all that. It takes time. It takes trust. And that's what we don't want to have. We don't want the trust items. We don't want to put that trust forward and perpetuate a, a trust that's false. Right? Because in the end, those virtual devices in the past, we trusted those virtual devices. We trusted that printer. We trusted that third party printer. We trusted that child service. Right? Um, if you go back to the Capital One example, um, they got hacked maybe two years ago, right? Um, and a young lady who hacked them used to work for AWS. So she knew the back in the AWS cloud when she was on the front end, the Capital One server, she made create herself a back, a back door for herself and she was cleaning them out. And they had no idea. It looked like it was coming from the back end of the AWS server. So a third party. If they'd been using zero trust, they would have made her verify her credentials every single time thus eliminating the possibility for gaining access because she would have to verify it every single time. What happened was she ended up verifying with an older ID that they never took off and they did their job and she had to be verified every time. Someone would have called like, hey, this employee is no longer here. Boom, let's stop that, let's stop that, let's stop that lead right there. She's no longer here. All right, so I told you we come out 
You know, cluster architecture and a sword is in the deep. The sword is a type of security, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. I know that the students are getting jobs all the time. I say, hey, you're going to get a job. Don't worry about getting a job. Worry about how much you're going to get paid. You, you can get a job. The difference between getting a job and getting the, the job you want is going to be a change. That's going to be the differential factor. You can be able to get a job. It's just what are you going to be doing at the job? So take a look at this. Number one, cybersecurity market is expected to grow by 300 billion would it be by 2024, right? That's half of the current lottery. Almost like it's 700 million. Oh, 700 million, not half. My math is way off. <laughs> Can't do that. Look, I should fire the world. <laughs> Global spending, cybersecurity exceeds one trillion in, but in 2021. On average, a small business spends less than $500 on cybersecurity. On average, small business spends less than $500. I can name off some small businesses that make quite a chunk of change right now here in Rhode Island. Those who say job lot, medium to small business, not a worldwide menu, right? right? Some of the furniture stores around here, parties, not a worldwide vendor, small business, small medium business, right? How good is that cybersecurity? How, how weak are they? How strong are they? I hope they have their own in house cybersecurity. I don't know. Can't speak to that. But they're not, they're not Google. They're not Walmart. They're not any big box. They're not Amazon. They're not spending billions of JP Morgan or Microsoft here spending billions annually. Um, the US government spent in 2019 spent 15 billion on security. Every third company has purchased data breach insurance coverage for cyber liability. If one third of all companies are buying insurance for cyber liability, what does that tell you? That the threat is high. The threat is high. Side. How why is the threat so high? The threat's high because it's too easy. If I told you one fifth, 20% of all phishing attacks are successful, you would believe me. I hope it's true. So I'm gonna ask the question of the you raise your hands. How many people between social media and their phone have 100 contacts? Just raise your hand. Have 100 contacts between social media and your phone. Have 200. Just keep your hand up. 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. All right. I'm gonna call it a thousand of you because I'm gonna do that math. I want to embarrass myself. All right. So if 20% of a thousand is 200, right? That means 200 people on your phone or social are gonna be affected by a phishing attack. They're gonna they're gonna fall away from wherever you just felt to. And then from that, let's say another 200 and another 200 and another 200, it just spreads out. That's why you that's what we see it so much in our IPS. That's we see it so much on our monitor, the phishing attacks. It's, it's too easy. I got caught here last year with a fishing attack so much that Nick Teller called me. Yeah. He called me. He said, hey, I got you. Like, yeah, you hear and swear. I was like, it's dirty to use COVID. That was dirty. That was dirty to use COVID. Of course, I clicked it because it said COVID. I was like, I clicked that one. <laughs> Done. And I was like, oh, how about here? It was 15 minutes before I heard it. I was like, he's like, I know this is fine. I know this is fine. But fishing happens to everyone. It happens to everyone. It's very easy to happen. You click that clickbait, you see that little puppy in the window, you hear that little song go off, you go, you click that, and then voila, the door is open. Companies pay up to $500,000 for hackers to test their systems. While that is true, a lot of companies are turning to in house pen tests. They're turning to in house pen tests. It's too expensive to do it out of house. Remember, about, remember when cybersecurity was information security years ago, and pen testing was new, and everyone was doing pen testing, pen testing, pen testing? Or everyone's doing cybersecurity. Hey, you gotta get a security company here. We gotta get a third party in here. It's expensive. Why not just have your own in-house pen testing and have them separate from the IT and cybersecurity department? Have them completely Chinese wall, firewall, segregate it off, and then have them come and perform that test. That's just good business. That's just good business. That's not paying for your insurance. All right. So a couple more stats. A couple more stats. We'll talk about this one. Corporate networks face 31% of all server attacks from botnets. 40% of all server attacks are aimed at small business. Why, why, why are all these small businesses being targeted? This is not enough protection. Can a small business really afford to hire someone at cost with a cyber professional cost? They can't afford to hire, they can't afford to put that person on payroll. That one, that one time site visit might, might be their budget for the month, might be their budget for the quarter, depending on what, how bad it is. Right? And the reason the price is so high is because there's such a shortage in professionals in cybersecurity. That shortage is the continued perpetuation of the increasing threat 
and as we talk about the increasing threat, 84% of cyber attacks were all attributed to being email in 2021. 84% of all attacks, period, in the world are email. We've all written an email. You all know how easy that is to deliver an attack. Only thing else is how do you embed it? How do you, that's the hard part. How do you get them to take the bait? How do you get that fish in the lure? How's that? How do you set that, that fly fishing hook just right in the tape? That's the question. It's not can you write the malware? Can you perform the malware perform? It's will they take the bait? And if you, your, the odds are against you. If you told me 20% of the time I'm going to win at Vegas, <laughs> I take those odds. <laughs> I take those odds. I know it sounds like cold odds, but I take those odds. It's better than some of the crappy odds you're getting right now. That's better than playing 21 sometimes. <laughs> right? I have bad luck, so it's a great odd for me. <laughs> right? 93% of all criminal cyber cases penetrate in network organizations and networks. 90% of cases, some cases, Cyber criminals can penetrate networks. I can sit here and show you a video after video of social engineering and someone penetrate. It's not that hard. I used to do it in the army all the time. It didn't be someone else. My, my biggest gig was I want to sit here and just smoke it. I'm going to smoke for a week. I'm going to smoke a cigarette. Smoke a cigarette. Eventually, everyone there is going to think I work there. And I'm going to say, hey, hold the door for me. And they say, oh, well, he, he's been here for like two weeks smoking cigarettes. So. <laughs> Come on in. Come on into our secure facility. Come on in. Don't we, don't try to check me for your badge. Just come on in. Walk on in. Right? You're going to start questioning yourselves on that. When we start seeing billions and billions of billion dollars leaked out, there's so many job opportunities out there. Charlotte, for instance, Charlotte has like a 50 or 60% deficit in cybersecurity professionals. Just, just want to hire you. Who's home there? Thank God. Uh, Big for America has a home there. I think they're there in Phoenix. I think, I think both they are both. Both Cisco's there. Cisco's there is a home. These are major, this is a major hub that's lacking tons of experience. And this is continuing on. They're just hiring, just hiring. Hey, do you have a degree? Is it is it close to cybersecurity? Come on. Come on. Can you, can you set up a firewall? Yeah, sure. Hey, can, hey, come on. These are all the things we see that are going on. The zero trust, back to it, is something you must do. And you kind of already do it already. We, we use two-factor authentication, and we're going to talk about authentication. Um, I didn't know what kind of audience I was going to have, so I'm going to make this extremely brief. You all know what authentication is. Authentication consists of, consists of something you know, you have something you are, right? We all already know these. They're working on some other ones. Like, I think geolocation is becoming real big nowadays, where you are. Um, I'm not on board with that just yet. I'm 50 50 on it. But I know you can spoof a location. I knew my gambling habit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to drive that and go gamble. So, um, as you do that, you go through those things and you see those things. And you see these examples of trust. And, and when we, the users, we're bad at it as a whole. It's bad as a whole. Um, I say this all the time. We all click it. You all have done this. I say, I'm going to use her as an example. Um, when I see a terms or conditions from Google or a game or Xbox or PlayStation, whatever it is, I click it and I treat it just like my wife when she busts it. I say, yes, not my head. Very fast. Whatever you want, sweetheart. Whatever you want. <laughs> whatever you want. I'll do that just to get access to Google or to whatever site I'm trying to use. I don't want to read it. At one point in time, they had jokes on the bottom of the Google, Google thing. <laughs> That jokes, I believe it said something like you can pay with your first unborn child or jokes or something, something insane. Like, I don't know, guys. Don't quote me on that. But it's something, it was jokes. They were like, because no one's reading the terms of service agreements. But when those terms of service agreements are important, because you're giving away, you're giving away your right right then. You're trusting them. Well, here at Johnson Wells, we don't trust a whole lot. Here's a great example from Johnson Wells. This is a student example. This is a student example. This is basically two factor authentication and additional, additional band just register for bias. They're not trusting. They're not trusting. Simple as that. Not trusting items. Not trusting. Going through the faces, not trusting, checking it out. Um, it's asking you to verify where multiple times who you are just simply to register for bias. And this is here in college. This is here. Yes. Did you say zero trust? It's everyone on your network. Yeah. I would not say zero trust is just using the VPN. 
I would say on your neck. On your neck. I would say, I would say behind the firewall internally. Yeah. After it's been verified multiple times. Yes. But as zero trust as technical as a technical definition, you have to constantly continuously verify that person, which brings into that automated piece where you're constantly checking. So whatever your much like your time to live when you're trying to do the, like a TCP I can't take or something to use a simple example, you try so many times to look like times out, correct? Same thing here, we're gonna try TSC X amount of times. We're gonna send that hello packet. That's probably there. So hello packet five minutes. Are you alive? Like, are you are you still verified? Are you still here? Um, in terms those terms, and we're constantly checking to make sure that person's still there. And as we do that, you're gonna give your credentials, gonna check your certificates, however your system set up. It's different when you take over and over again, your your password may be you know, asking entered again. Um, you all see it sometimes. I mean, you've been on a banking website. You're on the banking website, you've been on there, and you go get a cup of coffee, you get caught up, you're doing something else, next thing you know, things all of a sudden as your session is ended, right? That's part of it. That's part of it. We're gonna, we're gonna trust and make you get it and get it. And if we don't care, you, you set your computer right here, save the problem. We don't know that. We're gonna keep track, we're gonna keep track of it. Another broad example. We're in college, you gotta go to nightlife, you gotta have a good time. <laughs> gotta have a good time. Bouncer is probably the best. The best answer of zero trust in real life, real life example. You have your ID card. ID cards now have federal standards, right? You can be scanned, you can be checked. Um, you try to get into a club or a bar. I remember this in my, 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 my younger years, maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> you go there, get your head for match. Something you are. Ish, ish, <laughs> your college again, ish. <laughs> might, be, might be your brother or sister. <laughs> might be your brother or sister. Uh, might even know your birthday or a street you were named for or a street you put down, the studio you was in. Um, they might scan it. All of those are multiple factors, forms of authentication to make sure that that is viable. That is viable. That is viable. That's basically zero trust. The, bou the bouncer is exhibiting zero trust. I'm going to continue to verify you until you walk into this club, into this safe area, right? So you're behind the firewall of the bouncer. So you're inside. We know you're good. Is he going to check up multiple times while you're in the club? Hopefully not. That'd be weird. But. <laughs> But that's a good example. Ticketing system, MBTA ticketing system. Ticketing system. This also a little student entry. I was asked for some things, you can call some things at me. Uh, I didn't realize how complicated electronic tickets are nowadays. They, they are a lot more sophisticated than I had originally thought. Granted, I don't think ticketing systems in trains a lot, but I do use a lot of sports tickets and stuff like things. I didn't realize how intricate this was now. We know when you get on a train, you get your little paper tickets things. Oh, well, you gotta walk it down, stamps and checks it. On this one, constantly updates. Constantly updates. Constantly validates where you're at. Some tickets even know the GPS location and can tell you, and they'll give you an alert. Hey, you are here. They ask permission. You downloaded the app, they ask permission. You said yes. You got it, yes. You have the terms, you can have my GPS, it's on. It's a very real item, log on. You can have my GPS. So it tells you, hey, you know what? Your, your stop's coming in. Two stops out, 15 seconds out. It's constantly checking. It's constantly checking. How many people have ever, I've never done it. How many people have ever had an electronic ticket and get on the bus though or the train? Like, what, is, what happens? It's constantly refreshing, constantly refreshing, and just it knows exactly where you are. It knows exactly where you are. It's telling you, it's constantly validating your ticket. Your ticket is still, not, still, still not trusting the ticket. It makes it very hard to have a false ticket because it's constantly being validated. It checks the next stop. If you had a fake ticket, this is what I would do. I would screenshot it. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> no problem. And now, oh, that stop was three stops ago, sir. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, I missed it. No, you, you should have updated, sir, to, to, to maintain the validity of, of, of it as you were going through. I, I've done that. What was that? <laughs> I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tried that. All right, your business is a whole. Your business as a whole. Zero trust is huge. And here we're going to talk about a little fine, it's a little bit of federated standard here and some different things there. But as a whole, business mergers. This is when it just happened. When it just happened. When Google Cloud bought, damn it, they had to take in all their risk, all their problems. They had to take on wholesale. They had to take on wholesale. It's like taking on, a, uh, I'll use an example of a good friend of mine. His daughter found a straight kitty. They brought her home. That was a bad idea. But now he just had his house fumigated with fleas. So 
She, he took all the risk of that little kid, right? That little kid, and he's like, that little kid just lost me eight thousand dollars in bed. That little kid would have been right back in bed. <laughs> Good luck. But needless to say, they had to take on all their risks, all their problems, everything that goes on. How much are they going? Even though they're in the same company now, how much would you trust their problems? How much are you going to trust their users' computers? Are you going to reissue computers? At minimum, you're going to re-image computers. That's a minimum thing you're going to do. You might run two separate networks at some time until you can merge them all together. But that's the band-aid. That's the band-aid fix. And eventually, you need to be under the same umbrella, under the same security protocols, under the same policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you start doing big, big vintages like this, this is critical for zero trust. You can't take on it encompass someone else's risk and their architecture and all their problems. They're unknown to you at that time. So everything's top right-hand corner of that risk matrix. Red, red. High probability, high impact, right? Because you, it's unknown to you. Best case scenario, you have good insurance. You start paying for people to come in and fix your problems. That's your best case scenario. That's not such a good case. All right. Questions, comments, concerns? I'm finishing up. Um, I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to open up some questions or anything at this point in time. A lot of them that <laughs> Questions? Am I good on time? You know, no? I was that good. Everyone's in super form. Awesome. Uh, here's some contact information if you need to see me. I'll be walking around here shortly. I'm going to bring up uh, Crystal. Crystal. We're very crystal, and she's gonna close us out here today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davis, uh, for this educational evening. I think it's fascinating that 84% of cyber attacks were committed via email in the last year. It's kind of alarming. I mean, personally, I have three emails, including my university one. So make sure all your spam settings are set. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everybody in attendance this evening. Your registration for this event included a gift to the College of Engineering and Design, which will really work to provide a truly unique and exceptional experience that prepares our students for future success. This experience is made possible by the generous support of our loyal donors and gifts of all sizes combined to have an impact on our students that is truly powerful. As an alumni donor, your gift also demonstrates your investment in our mission, which can inspire additional support from other members of the JV community, as well as corporate donors and foundations. For our online members, you can make an additional gift by clicking the link in the chat window. Thank you for your support. I sincerely hope that everybody enjoyed today's discussion, part of the Jingu Connects family of programming. And I hope that you will find again in the future for the full listing of upcoming events, including our alumni executive discuss innovation and evolution on November 16th. All of our events can be found on alumni.jingu.edu. Thank you again for participating and joining us tonight. Have a wonderful